Ron, no matter how many times I come over that rise over there, the view of the Mundy Mundy Plain never fails to leave me breathless. Yeah, it's a very evocative outback view, isn't it? Just fantastic. We're just outside Silverton, not far from Broken Hill, and this is the gateway to the outback, isn't it, really? Yeah, it really is. It's what I like to call the accessible outback, because here we're only a day's drive from the major capital cities, Brisbane, yeah. Melbourne, Sydney, yep. Adelaide. Yeah, even old Adelaide. Yeah, yeah it's only <laughs> just down the road. So, mate, where are we heading from here? From the historic mining colossus of Broken Hill, we're heading to Silverton and then west and north, passing cattle and sheep properties, some of which offer farm stays and four-wheel drive tracks to enjoy. Our route touches on the famous dog fence before swinging east to the small outpost of Milparinka and historic Depot Glen, where the first European explorers in the region were trapped for six months. From there, we'll turn north to the remotest town in New South Wales, Tipperborough, once the centre of a not-so-rich goldfield, but now the gateway to Sturt National Park. Travelling through this vast park, we'll reach the outpost of Cameron Corner, where three states meet, where a lonely store is a welcome respite for the adventurous traveller. Outback country, you don't have to travel across the country just to find it. No, that's right. So we've brought the flies on again, mate, but we've also got our mates from MSA 4 Drive Accessories have given us their Ranger to bring along on the trip. Toyo tyres have fitted some tyres to the Benz and also your Land Cruiser. Yeah. Talking about the Benzes, the X-Class, that is a brand new product for Australia. New one tonne double cab ute. It's going to be really interesting to see how that goes in the outback. In the back of one of those Mercedes, we got a phone booster from Powertech. Now that's a device that brings in a lot more strong phone signal when you're out in the outback, increases your mobile phone coverage. Yeah, I've read a little bit about them. It's going to be really good to see how they go out here. Something else that's handy to have out here is good refrigeration. Thunder Accessories have got a brand new product, a really nifty looking 12 volt fridge. Yeah. Also in the Ranger, new LED lights from Great White. We'll be testing them out tonight. Yeah, looking forward to that. One thing we don't want to be testing out here is the insurance. But it's good <laughs> to know we've got Club 4x4 insurance along ah, with us. Ah, excellent, excellent. Out here, you can get yeah. stuck anywhere. Yeah. So let's get out there and hit the tracks. Okay, sounds good to me, mate. Hey Matt, I've just been talking to Beth out at uh, the Daydream Mine and um, she's expecting us to come out there and uh, have a look around. I think it'll be re really well worthwhile. A little bit different to the flat plains we've been looking over for the last few minutes. And um, so yeah, so that's where we're gonna go. You, you heading out with us? No uh, Matt, I think we'll pass on that and we might um, go and check out some of the galleries around Silverton. There's a few artists in town there and probably get a bit of outback culture. Sounds good to me, mate. No worries, we'll see you soon then. All right, mate, we'll find you somewhere. While Matt's heading off to find some outback culture, I'm off to the old Daydream Mine, just a short drive off the blacktop between Broken Hill and Silverton. This country was first opened up in the late 1850s by pioneer grazers coming through here with their mobs of sheep but it was the discovery of rich deposits of silver, lead and zinc that really opened up the country. We're gonna go and check this mine out, one of the originals, and still as it is, it's fantastic to look at. Beth, you own the tourist lease on this mine. Tell yes. us a little bit about the Daydream mine. The very first discovery was back in 1876 and um, the Daydream was 1881, so okay. between the first and the Daydream wasn't long. They'd come from the Copper Triangle, yep. uh, Moonta, Kadena and Burra yep. in South Australia and uh, because they were running out, yeah. they needed to come and find more. So they were Cornish miners? Yes, they were uh, Cornish uh, and a few German. Okay. But yeah, mostly the Cornish and they were really hard, hard workers. There's lots of different shafts going off here and drives off this Oh, mine. there's four kilometres underneath here. Wow. Oh yeah. It was considered to be the biggest of the smallest mines. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And an extremely rich mine too. Yeah. Uh, silver, lead and zinc? Yeah. Or? S mainly silver. Okay. Yeah. The components in here was yeah very high grade. Mm. 
So how deep underground are we at the moment? Well, at the moment, we're about 70 feet. So okay. it's on the second level. And the third level is nearly 100 feet. Okay. So the old, you know, 30 metres, but we stick to 100 feet. I reckon the lights on the Land Cruiser are pretty poor. But could you imagine going to work with this leading the way, 100 foot underground, and then swinging a pick, chasing a piece of ore? I couldn't. I wonder what Matt is up to in his quest for culture and interesting people in Silverton. So the people you bring through here, what's their experiences like? Ah, oh, they love it because yeah. they get to bang their heads on a couple of places. And... <laughs> You see our Silverton Gallery is getting a bit of culture in the bush, eh? Wonder how Ronnie's going back down there in the mine, eh? I love a bit of culture. Geez, the old noggin has taken a hammering down here. I rarely think of myself as a tall bloke, but down here, I'm a giant, while those old Cornish miners were pretty small. Let's get out of here. We're heading up the road to LD Station and it's pleasant camping, good accommodation and fun four-wheel drive tracks. You know, I've been coming out to this region of New South Wales and nearby South Australia ever since I was a kid. And one of the great things that have occurred here is the number of properties that have opened their doors to travellers. For people used to and at home in the cities, it gives them a great opportunity to experience life in the bush and to understand a little better how our country folk live and survive out here. Yeah, well, that was a pleasant evening, or a couple of evenings, in fact, at Deldy. It's a, always a top spot to go to, isn't it, mate? Yeah, mate, I think we're becoming regulars there. I've been there a bit lately. Yeah, six months ago we were there and uh, back again. Like I said, it's always a pleasant spot and um, good company and a really well set up uh, a station for a farm stay. And great country for driving forward wheel drive. Right? Yeah, some fabulous country in that, in that hill country. But um, anyway, we're heading north, um, heading up towards the dog fence and uh, then across the Mill Perinka. So we've got a few k's to do today. I mean, 400 or so, it doesn't sound far, but uh, out here, 400 k's can be a real big day. It flattens off as we get further northwest, doesn't it, Ron? So it'll be the last we see of the Barrier Ranges. Yeah, mate, they peter out and, um, and then after that you get just the occasional hill. People say it's flat out here, but it's really just lightly undulating. There's always a creek or um, a low hill or, or whatever. Yeah, it's always changing and that's what keeps it interesting. So yeah, we'll, uh, we'll cruise along and see how we go, mate. Hopefully there uh, won't be any troubles. Our luck wasn't in though, and one of the vehicles got a puncher from the sharp edged rocks that litter these outback tracks close to the range country. And most OE tyres on vehicles aren't meant for this type of terrain. You can bet it'll be hot when you get a puncher, which makes it even more fun changing a tyre. We're heading to the dog fence, which some say is the longest fence in the world, stretching for around 5,000 kilometres from Western South Australia, through the outback of that state, to the borders of New South Wales and then Queensland, before heading north, deeper into the Sunshine State. The purpose is to keep dingoes away from the sheep flocks of Eastern and Southern Australia, and Dave, who we are meeting today, is the operations manager for the New South Wales section of the fence, in the continual battle against the marauding dogs. Dave, is it? Yeah. Ron Moon, right? G'day, Ron. Yeah, Dave Harrington. Good to meet you. Yeah. You're the, you're the manager of the New South Wales yeah, I'm the, section uh, of the fence? I'm the operations manager for the Border Fence Maintenance Board. Okay. So how long's the total length of the fence that you look after? Yeah, just under 600 k's, Ron. Yeah. Okay. So, and I know it goes along the border, South Australian 
a New South Wales border? Yes, um, goes from probably about 120 k south of where we're standing now. Yep. And it goes all the way through to Cameron's Corner. Yep. And then from Cameron's Corner, it goes uh, east along the Queensland New South Wales border. Okay. Uh, to a point about 15 kilometres east of Hungerford. Okay. And what's the idea of the fence? The point of it is to stop dingoes, wild dogs, uh, coming in from South Australia and Queensland um, into New South Wales. It's it's sort of protecting the New South Wales uh, sheep and wool industry. So, I mean. How many dogs are we talking here? A dozen or? Oh no, there's large numbers of dogs on the other side of the fence and, um, and it's certainly doing a great job keeping them out. Right. So we're talking in the hundreds, are we? Or I would more say probably in the thousands. Wow. Mm, yeah. Wow, so, that's yeah, incredible. No, quite a few dogs out there. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So the road beside the fence, is that a public road? No, it's not, Ron. That road either side of the fence is strictly for my staff to access the fence. Okay. And to, to do the necessary maintenance and repairs from time to time. It's no public access, I'm afraid. Okay. And look, that's for their safety, Ron. As you can understand, that they're working at different places along the fence. They could be down in between two sand hills. Yep. And unfortunately, there have been instances in the past where they've been near misses. Yep. Um, and it's certainly something I don't want to have to um, nah, <laughs> nah. have happen there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, for a lot of people, yeah, when they come in on this road that we've been travelling on, this is their first side of the fence, yep. and you, you can travel on the public road, of course. Correct, yeah, and I mean, we're only talking a uh, distance of about 40 metres there, yeah. so yeah. they're certainly not missing uh, any visual aspect of the fence, but certainly, yeah, driving okay. along the fence is okay. strictly prohibited. Yeah, so it's a full-time full -time job for you and your crews? Yes. Wow. Yeah. yeah. It's just unbelievable the effort that goes into keeping dogs out, isn't it? Exactly, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, that's great, mate. Thanks very much for that. No it's, worries, um, Ron, yeah. Really, uh, really interesting and informative. And, no uh, problem. We'll try and keep people off this on public road. Exactly, yeah. Road. No, really appreciate that. Okay. Yeah. No worries, mate. Thanks, Thanks Ron. very much. Thanks a lot. The drive from the far western border of New South Wales with its red sand ridges and sandy plains is vastly different to what you'll find a short distance east as you head towards the small historic settlement of Milparinka, which was once the centre of a small, very remote goldfield. Today, the town's population is about half a dozen if everyone's at home, but then there's a lot of history to discover, a great little pub and a small camping area to enjoy. Back in the 1880s, this small community was the centre of the Albert Goldfields. It was a pretty harsh environment as you can see. But those early pioneers, they thought big, dreamt huge, and built these buildings to last. Such are the dreams of men. But anyway, we're going to call this place home for the night. And there's a little pub just up the road as well. There's nothing better when you're in the bush than always having fresh food and cold drinks at hand without having to worry about restocking the esky with ice. That's where a 240 12 volt fridge comes in. Runs on both 240 volts or 12 volts off your car. Plenty of them on the market and this is a new one from Thunder Accessories. Now Thunder do a range of four wheel drive products, recovery gear, lights, all sorts of odds and ends. The fridge product is brand new for them. They've got this 60 litre chest freezer as well as a 30 litre drawer fridge freezer which puts into camper trailers and so forth. Like most other 12 volt fridges on the market, this has got a good sturdy construction, it's pretty solid outside. Big, sturdy, heavy duty handles for lifting or tying it down. Love the uh, bottle opener on the side here for getting your stubbies open. Digital control panel with a turbo button for chilling things down really quick. It's adjustable, you can bring it down to minus 18 degrees up to plus 10. So it's a fridge freezer combo. And also there's a USB port here for charging up little devices like a phone or a Game Boy or whatever. The one thing that's unique on this Thunder fridge that I haven't seen on any other product is this dual opening lid. You can open it from this side, but just as easily from this side to access it from either side of the vehicle. Now that could work well when you're going out of the side of the canopy there, or if you're in a vehicle where you can get in from either side. That's really smart. It also allows it to be easily lifted off altogether and jump right in there. It's got double hinges on both sides, so they're pretty strong and sturdy, not going to break off in a hurry. 
I really like that it's smart design. The Thunder 60 litre fridge has been keeping our food and drinks chilled on this trip. GT's been cooking up a storm out of here. We're having a great time. Well, Ron, Mill Brink is a nice little pub. Good people there too. What are we up to today, mate? Uh, we're going to head north up to uh, Depot Glen, Sturt's camp. There's a grave there of uh, his 2IC pool. And then uh, we'll go out to Sturt's Cairn as well and uh, walk up the hill there and have a fine vista of this incredible country that we're travelling through. Mate, it's a pretty unique landscape around here. It's almost a moonscape. Yeah, it is. That's for sure. It's unbelievable, isn't it? You wonder how uh, they grow sheep out here or cattle. Mate, it looks like they're farming rocks to me. You're not wrong, Matt. This Gibber country, Gibber being derived from an Aboriginal word for stone or rock, covers vast areas of inland Australia. The gibbers are what left after the sand and dust have been blown away by the desert winds. Most of the time the stones are worn smooth as they are polished by the wind-blown sand and many have a veneer of iron and silica, a desert varnish that gives them that rich red colour. But in other places such as we'll find along this route, the ground is almost completely covered in fragments of white quartz. It's amazing! What is also amazing is that when it does rain here, the cattle people tell me, the low vegetation that grows makes great cattle feed. Charles Sturt was one of Australia's greatest explorers. Back in the 1820s and 30s, he led expeditions west of the Blue Mountains, following the Macquarie River to discover the Darling River, and later sailing a whale boat down the Murrumbidgee and Murray Rivers to the sea, and back up again. Like many of his time, he thought there was a vast inland sea, and in 1844 he set out to discover it. He even took a boat along to sail on the sea, my great-great-grandfather being the man in charge of the craft. I guess, with what we know of Lake Eyre and climate change, Sturt and his men were a few thousand years too late. When Charles Sturt and his men came here in 1844-1845, they were the first Europeans to penetrate the interior of Australia. It was a hell of a year. Big drought was on and they were trapped down at Depot Glen for six months. They made a different stuff, those guys. When the rains did come, did he turn around and go back home? No. They pushed on further inland. It was an unbelievable achievement. My great-great-grandfather was with them. So I guess he helped build this rock can. Let's go down to Depot Glen and have a look down there. This is Sturt's Depot Glen, where he and his men were trapped for six months between January and July 1845. It was the only known water supply and they searched, they searched a hell of a lot. They couldn't retreat and they couldn't advance. And during that time, James Poole, the second uh, in charge of the expedition, up and died of scurvy. They buried him here and carved this bloodwood tree. Just a few days later it rained and the party pushed north from here up to Fort Grey and then on to Air Creek, just north of present day Birdsville. And we're heading north from here as well, up through Gumvale Gorge, over to Tipperborough. With modern navigation aids, you'd think you'd have no trouble finding your way to any particular point on the Earth's surface. But while you may know exactly where you are by your Hemi navigator or GPS unit, and you may even be able to see the place you want to go on the map, the problem is often finding your way between the two. I know, I've been geographically embarrassed, <laughs> never lost mind you, more times than I can remember. About 30 years ago, I went to this old gold mine tucked in the hills and I want to see it again and see how the ravages of time and weather are treating it. We're at the very remote Waratah gold mine, south of Tipperborough, tucked in amongst these dry, rugged ranges. We 
we had a hell of a time coming in here. We got permission off the property owner and he said it's a four-wheel drive track. Well, it was to start off with. And then it just degenerated into a creek bed and then, then into nothing. We had, we had quite a trip getting in here. They were tough men back in those days. We're going to head to Tipperborough now. We had an easier time getting out of there once we found a station track. Then it was onto a good dirt road before finally reaching the Silver City Highway and its bitumen just south of Tipperborough. So we've just arrived in Tibberborough. We've come up from Milparinka. Took the back way around, stayed away from the highway. It was pretty good fun, interesting stuff. It's you know, another vast rocky plain. It's hot, there's flies, but it's got that rawness about it, a certain beauty. You've got to be here to appreciate it, really. They told us this Sunset Hill is pretty good at this time of day, so we're going to sit back here, watch the sun go down. Might even have a cold one. Then we'll go back into town, set up camp for the night. Well, we decided to come to the outback for our latest off-road adventure. We knew we'd need some decent tyres for the cars to cope with the rocky, harsh terrain out here. Ronnie's Land Cruiser was right. He's got the Toyo Open Country MTs on there. But the Mercedes-Benz X-Class vehicles with their 17 and 18 inch wheel fitments pose a new challenge for us. The mid-spec car with its 17s wasn't such a problem. Toyo came to the party again with a set of its Open Country All-Terrain 2s. They're a 265 70 series in 17 inch rim. Light truck construction, nice and tough for the harsh terrain out here. The 18 inch wheels on the power spec car, well Toyo don't have a tyre to fit that model in a light truck construction yet, so we had to leave the standard tyres on it. And we've already seen how tough these roads can be on those tyres. Toyo's Open Country AT2s, they're really a traditional all-terrain type tyre. They're a little bit more aggressive and tougher than the standard OE tyre offering, but they retain the wet weather performance, the braking, the handling, and the quietness of the standard tyre. So they're a really good compromise for someone who spends you know, a fair bit of time in the city and on the sealed roads, but like to get out in the country in the bush every now and then. You see here, you've got the little side biters along here, nowhere near as aggressive as the mud terrain tyres. The gaps here in the tread pattern, not as wide. You can have those blocks closer together so they don't make so much noise. The AT2s, they're available in both a passenger car style construction and a light truck tyre construction. Now, the light truck tyre has got a heavier sidewall in it, which is much tougher, more protection against those sharp rocks that will tear a passenger car tyre apart. There's a couple of great drives and some good campsites in the Sturt National Park, and sadly, we haven't got time to see it all. However, we won't miss out altogether. This trip, instead of heading directly to Cameron Corner, our final destination, we're going to head north and then take the jump up road to the old Olive Downs homestead. Along the way, we'll pass a couple of bird hides and hopefully some water points where there might be a bit of animal and bird life, and drive through the jump up country, which gives great views of the surrounding area. From Olive Downs, we'll head west to Fort Grey Homestead, where there is a well-established campground and a walking track to Charles Sturt's old campsite on the edge of Lake Pinaroo. And the rams are listed wetland and an impressive bird watching spot when it has water in it. We've spent the best part of the day travelling through Sturt National Park from Tipperborough. Normally this park, 325,000 hectares of semi-arid desert country, is alive with kangaroos, but it's hot and it's dry and everything's back into survival mode and there's very few animals around, or that you can see, especially during daylight hours. Most of the roofs, in fact, are down in the pastoral country where there's a bit more water around. Anyway, we're heading on through the dog fence 
and ever onwards to another adventure. Well, we're back at the dog fence on the border of New South Wales and South Australia. One of the most important gates on the fence. The gate's always got to be closed. Keep the dingoes on that side and the sheep safe on this side. Well, that's the theory anyway. Man, the flies are bad. They are really friendly. From the gate in the dog fence, it's just a short drive to the Cameron Corner pub, store and camping area with all its delights and attraction, while nearby is the famous corner post. Well Ron, Broken Hill to Cameron Corner, not a bad run. Fantastic mate, lots of history, great country to pass through and ended up at this famous spot, Cameron Corner Post, where the three states of New South Wales, Queensland and South Australia meet. Yeah, also another spot with a great watering hole. <laughs> We've seen a few this time. Yeah, it was looking a bit like a pub crawl there sometimes. <laughs> but yeah, really, that's what makes travelling the outback fantastic. Right. You know, the watering holes, the places and the people you meet. Yeah, the characters you meet. My word. Well, we're sure to see some more of them as we head further north and we'll save that for the next episode. Yeah.